أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <coughs> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعن الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله and before beginning I have to thank the brothers and sisters who participated in today's masira uh, mashallah it's very beautiful beautiful you don't it's like you're in Jannah really when you see all the brothers and sisters coming together around the name of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and I also thank those of you who were in the masira and that you also came to tonight's program wow that's impressive mashallah I have to lecture or else I might have stayed home, yeah. <laughs> Continuing with the sayings of Abu Abdullah and Hussein from Medina to Mecca, from Mecca to Karbala, slowly we're getting to the point where Imam Hussein is leaving Mecca. Now there's a lot that happens in those three months, two or three months that Imam Hussein is in Mecca. And people are coming slowly in for the Hajj, we all know that Imam Hussein was not able to do Hajj. Now, some say that he had started his Hajj with the Ihram of Hajj, and then he had no choice but to leave the Hajj. Some say no, from the start, the Ihram that he wore was Umrah, and he had no uh, intention to do Hajj at all that year. Whatever it is, slowly the time is coming for Abu Abdullah and Hussein to leave Mecca. One of those sermons that he delivers. Now this is called a khutbah, a sermon. Now brothers and sisters, you might know, there's a difference between a khutbah and just a normal hadith, a saying. What differentiates, what sets a khutbah apart from other sayings is that khutbah is an official statement, official announcement, official lecture given in an official, formal setting. Yeah? A hadith might be like in a group with a group of people. Sometimes the imam is with one person. It's not done in a formal setting necessarily. If it's done in a formal setting, it's referred to as a sermon, as a khutbah. In this khutbah, Imam Hussein touches on another aspect. Now this aspect doesn't have to do with his movement directly, like the previous sayings and the dialogues that we covered. But at the same time, it shows the importance of something and highlights the importance of something for us as the followers of Imam Hussein. He takes this whole movement and he associates it with the concept of death. A concept that for many is the end of everything. Many of us might look at death as the end of everything. But from a Quranic perspective, it's the beginning of everything. It's just we're so caught up in this life, we just, we just kind of don't kind of understand. It's hard for us to fathom the fact that, hey, there can be other forms of life as well. We've gotten used to this form of life, which is perfectly fine. But what is expected is when someone is 60, 70, 80 years old, they're not like the 20, 30, 40 year olds of this dunya. Yeah? Sometimes we talk to our youth in a way that, hey, you should be looking forward to death. The kid is 12 years old, for God's sake. Why are you doing this to, the, to that kid? Like, this kid will grow up scarred. Yeah? Some of these books that we have, I've heard ulama, they kind of advise against individuals sometimes reading these books that speak about the details of this and that. And you're in the grave and you'll get smashed and then your brains come out of your nose and things like that. Okay, even if it's true... We have to be a little wise and understand that, hey, sometimes certain things will take hope away from our youth. Yeah. So personally, I don't understand the, the, the reason behind why someone would go through all the details of death when it comes to like a 12-year-old. Yeah. The other day, the other, in Ramadan time, I got a question. Some families, they force their kids to fast when they're five or six. Well, Allah didn't want it from you from them how come you want from them necessarily they have their kids fast okay if the kid wants to they want to but sometimes we overburden and it backfires sometime down the line even 10 20 years later maybe even 
we need to get the advice of even sometimes religious counselors that are out there. See, hey, am I doing it right or not? Anyway, at the same time, sometimes the, the information that we're transmitting to this youth is even wrong to begin with. No, who says everyone is going to get smashed in the grave? Like that's part of death, that you get smashed. Let's show me in the Quran. In the Quran, when it speaks, if anyone's getting beat up by the angels when they're dying, it's the ones who led evil lives in this world, not everyone. This concept of, hey, death is the worst thing to happen. No, ulama, urafa, awliya, they looked forward to it. Yeah, it might be a little bit of a different experience. Yeah, it might not be too easy either, but it's over with. You get it over with soon and you transfer to another world where you feel much better in. But yes, there's a condition to make sure that death is not going to be hard. And that is that I have to lead, inshallah, inshallah, a life full of observance of the wajib and haram of Allah. Our ulama tell us that the key to Jannah is one thing. How much after believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the deen, how much have you listened to him? That's the key to Jannah. If he says, this is wajib, you do it. If he says haram, you stay away. This is makruh. What does makruh mean? That means you can and cannot do it. Okay, just because someone commits makruh every now and then doesn't mean they're not going to make it. The key to Jannah, the key to Jannah, we had that hashtag a few days ago, right? Servitude. Servitude. Servitude says, hey, let me see what the mawla, the master wants from me. If he himself is saying, hey, it's better if you do it, but if you don't do it, it's okay. Ulama, great ulama that I've seen hundreds of other scholars sit in their presence. This is what they're saying. Students of Allama Taba Tabai. Right? Sometimes people say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. No, no, no. I'm just transmitting what we've seen. Yeah. No one's encouraging makruh and, musta and, and doing makruhat necessarily. But brothers and sisters, let's get it right. Wajib and haram for now. Ayatullah Bahjad says, if you do that, you can be the happiest person in the world. You have the key to Jannah. All right. So death isn't necessarily a bad thing, but at the same time, if we do, if we go too much into detail sometimes, especially with our youth, it might turn them off. It might take away their hope they have. Once again, I've heard ulama say, "Hey, it's not the best thing to keep going to the graveyard." Yeah, every now and then you feel like, "Hey, I need to be a little woken up from a little sleep that I'm going in and forgetting akhirah. Take a walk in the graveyard. Look what's going on there." Yeah, nothing's going on there, you see? <laughs> know that this is the end. But then there are some people that think that to reach high levels of irfan, every day they go to the graveyard. This might have an, a negative effect. No. The graveyard is not what's going to get you to Jannah, going to the graveyard every day. Every day listening to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going get to you, get you to Jannah. All right, having said that now, and talking about death, Imam Hussein in this sermon, he makes it all about something else now. He says, Alhamdulillah, wa ma sha Allah, wa la quwwata illa billah, wa sallallahu ala rasulih. You see, even the introduction sounds like a sermon, right? Khutta al maut ala wuldi adam, ma khutta al qalati ala jid al fatat. Wa ma awlahani ila aslafi ishtiyaq yaqub ila yusuf. He says, Praise be to Allah. Masha Allah, by Allah's will, everything happens with Allah's will. There is no power but with Allah and blessings of Allah upon His Messenger. Verily, death is bound with the sons of Adam. Please remember, He's saying this as He's leaving Mecca now to the people. Death is bound with the sons of Adam, meaning the children of Adam, you and I, all of us. We are bound by something called death. As a necklace around the neck of a young girl. Yes? Back then, I don't know about today, but back then, a young girl usually would have a necklace around her neck. He says the same way you can't find a young girl who doesn't have an, a, a piece of jewelry on her, and everywhere she's going, she will carry that jewelry with her. That same way, mot has been written, death has been written for mankind. Wherever they go, they have this jewelry with them. It's interesting. I haven't heard this tafsir before, but it just came to mind today, to me personally, that true, the imam is trying to draw a comparison here, and he's trying to say that, hey, wherever you go, it's with you. But there are other things that are always with us too that we carry around, okay? 
I don't know. He could have said it is like, because back then people would wear, wear turbans, right? Nowadays it's just me that's wearing it. But back then, everyone would wear turbans. It was just the thing. He could have said, hey, death is like a turban that a person carries around with them. Always has on their head. It's always with them. He used the necklace and jewelry, maybe, maybe, because true it is always going to be with them but at the same time it's something that adorns a person makes brings value brings value to things when you when a christmas tree without decoration isn't worth anything adornment jewelry these things bring value with them why is it that people don't want to wear plastic jewelry they'd rather wear something that's worth more yeah it makes a difference now i want to go a step further now he says jewelry. He says necklace. When he says this, it is something that brings value and beautifies in a way that people should understand this is something to look forward to. I love looking in the mirror and reminding myself of this. I look in the mirror to see it again. It's so beautiful. It's something that I like. Something that I like. Now sometimes people don't look in the mirror at all. They don't see this necklace. All they feel is like something's weighing down on my neck. Why is it so heavy? Bro, the heavier the better. It's jewelry, man. Right? But this person closes their eyes, doesn't look in the mirror, and all they feel is something's weighing down on them. As if a person who looks at it, understands what it's all about, will like it. As a matter of fact, let's go a step further even. If you think about it, I'm not going to explain it much. I want you guys to think about it. Whoever gets it, gets it. Whoever doesn't, maybe I'm wrong. Death and a life after death, of course. Not death meaning total annihilation and destruction and it's over. No, death meaning a newer, better life is something that gives, gives meaning to this life of ours that we're in now. Or else think about it. No matter how much I accumulate here, if there's a day is going to come, even if I live a thousand years, if a day is going to come that I can't take that which I accumulated here with me, it's not worth it. Why are some of these celebrities and like actors and, um, and, and, and singers, why are they committing suicide? I don't know. Maybe, maybe. I don't want to act like I know what I'm talking about here. But maybe one of the reasons is if death had been and the life after death had been explained to them properly, they would have more purpose in life. This person has reached everything they could reach in this life and they still feel empty inside. Have you noticed? I mean, it happens to me all the time. Well, not too much, but, cause, but you know, people who like, bu are always after buying that new phone, those new kicks, that new car, and so on. When you get it, after a few days, you're like, I wish I had that desire that I had before I had this new device or new toy or whatever it is. It always happens. You finally reach that thing that you were longing for all your life or for a good number of days or months or years. You reach it. After a while, it becomes normal. And again, you feel like I need to go maybe something after something else. Mankind, shaitan has us running in circles promising us that hey, what you're after is here. No, 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 no. What we're after is something somewhere else. To the point that someone reaches everything of fame and glory and money and wealth and all of that good stuff, yet they still feel empty inside. This is something that's out there, we all know. Maut is like a necklace, he says. True, it's always going to be there with you. That means it's going to eventually catch up to you and take over and you're going to pass away and leave this dunya. But the, reason, the fact that he uses the word jewelry and necklace, I feel like there's more to it. Anyway, let's move on. How I desire and long to meet my ancestors the same way Prophet Yaqub longed to be reunited with Yusuf Brothers and sisters, Prophet Yaqub, the love he had for Prophet Yusuf wasn't your normal love. It wasn't a normal father to son love necessarily. It was more than that. It was a waliyullah to another waliyullah. He likens his Eagerness to see his family on the other side, Abu Abdullah, likens it to that burning passion to, for Yaqub to reach Prophet Yusuf. What does the Quran tell us? Prophet Yaqub, he couldn't take it anymore. 
Out of grief, not out of crying and tears. Okay, this is something that we mistranslate sometimes. The Quran says, He went blind out of grief. Not necessarily shedding too many tears. He, would, he shed a lot of tears. He was one of the bakkain, they say, one of those who cried a lot. But it says he went blind because of all the stress that he was under for seeing Yusuf but not being able to ever reach him. وَبْيَضَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْحُزْنِ The grief made him go blind. Abu Abdullah likens his eagerness to, read, to go back to his ancestors to that. It's not metaphorical, brothers and sisters. Abu Abdullah wants to leave. His Shia, inshallah, after 60, 70 years, should also reach that point. I can understand a 20, 30, 40, 50 year old even, you know, still, you know, sticking to this life and, you know, having a good time. It's all, it's all good as long as it's halal. But come on, when you're 70, 80, 85, 84, 86, around that age, sometimes you see certain people, you feel like this person still isn't looking forward to the other side. What, do you, what, do you, what are you taking pleasure in in this life? I don't get it. Like, at, that's the time where this individual should have matured. If this person had lived a proper life, a normal religious life even, slowly Allah would have shed some light into their heart to the point that when they're 70, 80, now it's time to go. Okay, they, they feel like it's time to go. When you look at them, you see that in their actions, you feel like, okay, yeah, I'm here, but you know, it's like, I'm visiting, I'll be gone. Just like how I'm visiting Dearborn right now, I'll be gone in a week, you know? Some of these people, I've seen them with my own two eyes. He's like 80 years old, but it seems like there is no akhirah coming. And he's Muslim Shia. The expectation is that the older ones, we strive harder as we reach 30, 40, 45. We start trying to mature a little bit more. But if a person is sinning all their life, that maturity won't come. Allah has to shine it in the heart. You can't get it from the books. Verily, I proceed towards the place of my martyrdom, he says, which has been selected for me. It is as if I see the wolves of the desert of Bani Umayyah, of course. He's likening them to wolves. Tearing apart each limb of my body between Nawawis and Karbala. And filling their empty bellies with me. They came, one of the main reasons some of these people came to get a piece of Imam Hussein was to really fill their bellies. Now here's, here Imam Hussein is being metaphorical. For some filling their bellies, metaphorically, was that they became governors of other cities. For some filling their bellies was thousands of dinars maybe. For some, filling their bellies might have been one or two meals even. Some people who came to fight Abu Abdullah, they didn't have even weapons to bring from home. Because back then when you went to war, the government wouldn't provide you with weapons. You had to take your own weapons. Some people would walk. Some people had horses. They would ride their horses. That's how it was in battle back then. Some of these people who came to fight Abu Abdullah, they came with stones. They didn't have anything else. <laughs> they came with stones. These people might have been after like maybe one or two meals. I don't know. Something very insignificant. You sold your akhirah for two or three meals. A person doesn't turn this wretched and evil overnight, brothers and sisters. Younger people out there. You teenagers. Work hard because when you don't study hard and work hard, when you're 25, 30, you're not going to have time anymore to study and work hard. You might work hard, but you sit, since you didn't do the work in your teens, in those early 20s, no matter how hard you work, you just feel like you, you're not, you, it's hard for you to make ends meet. And it's getting later and later. Before you know it, you might be married, and it's even worse. A true Shia takes their life serious in their teens. Of course, play with your phones. I know all the apps out there, all the video games out there. Back then, when I was growing up, it was like PlayStation 2. Now there's the fourth one or something. Now you got Xbox. I understand all of that. And you can spend time on those things. Play sports. But hey, put a portion of your day for keeping it real. I used to hear this when I was a teenager. I'm like, what are they talking about, these older people? Now I know that I'm saying this, but there are going to be some people that, what is he talking about? Super Mario Kart. 
But it's just, I, I'm just going to say it because that's the tradition. That as we get older, we just feel so bad that I could have made more of my life. Let me say it to others. At least I said it. At least I said it. Maybe one out of the many. Maybe ten out of all the brothers and sisters out there take it serious. God knows these teenage years and the 20s and all that, even the 30s, they're good years. Some people didn't take life serious. It reached the point where to get a little bit of food or money or whatever, they take stones with them to Karbala to stone Abi Abdullah. Do you know who you stone in Islam? Not everyone is stoned in Islam. Some of the worst crimes have to have been committed to be stoned. If that even happens in the world today. They took stones. Why? They didn't take life serious in the beginning. They didn't practice taqwa throughout their lives so that when the bigger test comes, they say, okay, I'm going to pass this test. He says, there is no escape from, with, from that which has been written down by the pen of destiny, Imam Hussein says. And the pleasure of our household lies in the pleasure of Allah. Okay, number one, number one, brothers and sisters, the pen of destiny works even when it comes to Imam Hussein. Even when it comes to Imam Hussein, the pen of destiny is writing. He says, I can't get out of that. Brothers and sisters, for us too, the pen of destiny, whatever happens around, it happens. Instead of spending time and energy trying to figure out why this happened to me, it might be better to just figure out what should I do from here on. They say the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam, Allahumma Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Muhammad. He never said, what if? He never looked back in the sense that, that it's gonna, he's going to waste time trying to figure out what if I had done this? What if I had done that? I don't, I don't know about you guys. Though back then I, I enjoyed these little uh, novels and storybooks where you could choose your own destiny in them. Like Batman would get stuck in the sky like his whip was like about to break. So it would say, if you think Batman should jump into this window, go to page like 56. If you think Batman should just let go and fall, go to page 87. So you would go to each one of these two, try to figure out your destiny, or the destiny of Batman. <laughs> Some people, their life is this book. After they go down a certain path, they're like, let me go back and see, what if I had gone to that other one? See what happens to Batman there. Oh, he got grinded by like this big meat grinder. The Prophet, Rasulullah, our, our role model, it says he never said, what if? Okay, like we're going to figure things out Make decisions, move forward. Now, things might not go the way we want to. We'll, we'll take lesson from it. But we're going to go sit there and be like, what if we had done this? What if, oh man, I wish I had done that. No. Instead of putting time into that, brothers and sisters, let's put in time what we should do from here on. What's the next step I should take in life? Abba Abdullah says, there's no escape from the pen of destiny. Things are happening around us, whether we like it or not. What I have to figure out is what am I supposed to do in each of these situations? Because it's going to happen. What I have to be after is figure out what is the pleasure of Allah and satisfaction of Allah in each situation. Now brothers and sisters, what, how do I know the pleasure of Allah is in something or not? If it's wajib, the pleasure of Allah is there. If it's haram, his pleasure is not there. Very straightforward I think. Now someone might ask, how do I know what is wajib and haram? Someone asked me this last night. How do we know what is wajib haram? It's so confusing and mixed up. Well, the maraji have made our job easy, brothers and sisters. They've done the work 50, 60 years going through a hadith. You ask your question, he goes, says, give me a week. They might spend a week on one mas'ala, on one issue, to figure it out and come back and say, this is the fatwa that I have. They've made it easy for us. We just have to go and ask them. Online, they all have websites now. The wajib and haram is there. If it's not written, ask a shaykh. Contact them. Send the question in. They have Q&A part uh, sections in their websites. The wajib and haram of Allah is where the satisfaction of Allah is. So if a situation comes up, first thing I got to do is figure out the wajib and haram in that situation. That we're trying to be practical here. Figure it out and execute. Very simple. Verily we will endure his trials and secure the reward due for the forbearing ones. The sabirin. There shall never be separation between the Prophet and his progeny, Abu Abdullah is saying. And they will all be next to him in paradise. Thereby, 
the Prophet will rejoice by them. And thus Allah will fulfill what He has promised the Prophet through them. In other words, it's all about maut again. I'm looking forward to the other side. This side can't do justice. Whoever desires, now this is a call to all of us till today. Whoever, ala وَمَنْ كَانَ فِينَا بَاذِلًا مُهْجَتَهُ مُوَطِّنًا عَلَى لِقَاءِ اللَّهِ نَفْسَهُ فَلْيَرْحَلْ مَعَنَا This call echoes till today. You want to be Husayni? If the situation dictates, you should be willing to go as far as giving your life. Alhamdulillah, the situation usually doesn't dictate that for us. So I'm not going to use the... The excuse of I didn't get a black phone instead of a white one. So now I'm going to go against God. I'm not going to listen anymore. This is, this is nothing, brother and sister. The, the struggles we have, if you ask me, being here half my life in America, being in Qum half my life, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the struggles we have here, they are struggles. I don't want to undermine any of that. I don't want to downplay any of what people are struggling with here. But man, are people struggling elsewhere. أَلَا مَنْ كَانْ بَاذِلًا فِينَا مُهْجَتَهُ What does muhja mean? Let me translate this line first. He says, Whoever desires, desires to gift for us their muhja, one, and to make themselves, put, the, devote themselves to Allah uh, and meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then they should travel with me as I leave Mecca. Whoever is giving, willing to give their muhja, what does muhja mean? Some say muhja means your soul. Some say muhja means that wa the, the blood in the artery here of the heart, the blood of the heart, let's say. The blood of the heart, the most important and uh, a vital thing for survival. He says, who's willing to give their muhja to me, for me? Who is willing to devote everything to meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Meaning, in other words, go to the other life. Those are the people I want to follow me from Mecca onwards. From Medina to Mecca, they say there is maybe hundreds of camels with the, with the holy imam. Each camel belongs to a family, maybe, I don't know. There's lots of, there's a lo they're, they're, they're bringing loads of stuff with them, good for them. But they say after Mecca and now slowly towards Karbala, there's less and less and less and that's one of the units you can use to tell how big a caravan is. The number of camels they had back then. I've heard the number 200. 200 became like 20, 30 in the end. Something like that. Allah. I don't want people, he says, that are going to leave me on Ashura. From here onwards, I'm going to be a little more selective. Because the mission calls for the Abbasiyun. The mission calls for the Zainabiyun. And Husayniyun, not just everybody, not just anybody. Man kana fina badil al muhjatahu muwatin al ala liqa illahi nafsahu fal yarhal maana. Fa inni rahilun musbihan insha Allah. Why? Because I am leaving tomorrow, Abu Abdullah. He had no choice but to leave Mecca. They were there to assassinate him. He said, I'm not going to stay in Mecca and let blood be spilled in the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm doing what I'm doing for the Kaaba, for Mecca. You shall see, inshallah, brothers and sisters, future nights, there were some who wanted to have the Khilafah at the expense of the Kaaba, at the expense of the sanctuary of Allah. Abu Abdullah is doing everything for Islam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I'm going to end with this. There is a khutbah also that was that is that you hear here and there by Abu Fadl Abbas. Okay, now everyone's going to be listening and they're like, "Oh, that sounds cool." That Abu Fadl Abbas, when he sees that Imam Hussein doesn't have too many followers, he gets angry. He goes on the roof of the Kaaba and he delivers this khutbah that starts with "Ayyuh al Kafaratul Fajara," you kuffar, you Fajara, you sinners. And it goes on. Now, I heard this for the first time somewhere here on this side of the world. 
And I'm thinking to myself, it sounds cool. And if it really was out there, like, how come I haven't heard it in the 17 years of being in like Qum and all the majalis that we would go there? Because I didn't come to America for like 13 years of my life. I stayed there. Even in the summers, I was there. I didn't come. I didn't fly. I didn't. So you're going to all these majalis, and you're like, how come I haven't heard it in one majlis, one lecture? So I did a little bit of research. And it turns out that this khutbah, although it sounds like super cool, but as I said before, we're not going to let emotions sh show us the way when it comes to our religion. And to draw those tracks in history that we're going to actually go on and go by when it comes to forming and shaping our lives and how we deal with things. We're going to be very, very selective. We're going to be very strict and careful and scrutinative. I did some research. I found out that there's, this is khutbah is in one book. I, I really exhausted whatever I had in me to figure out where this is. I only found one book that no one's heard of and like a copy of it is found in I don't know which part of the world. And that's it. Brothers and sisters, just because it sounds nice doesn't necessarily mean it's reliable. Sometimes things sound so cool and then we rely on them because it reads with what we would like. It, makes, it brings more madlumiyah, for example. You know, we can relate to it. It brings more madlumiyah for the imam. But then within the wording of that hadith, khutbah, whatever it is, there are certain things that are said that don't read with the ideology that was given to us through the Ahl Bayt. Before you know it, people are using this everywhere as an excuse to do certain things hurting the religion, hurting the image of the faith, whatever. I just thought it would be nice now that we reach this uh, part of this timeline that we're going through of Imam Hussein leaving Mecca. That yes, we do have a khutbah that's narrated and some people really love it. But if you go to the ulama, you don't see anyone talking about it. Anyone. All you find is the lay people usually talking about it. Now once again, I might be totally mistaken. But I asked a lot about this. I even sent a question in to an organization in Qum. Although I worked for that same organization. But I sent it in to get an official response. And I did get an official response. And they also said, no, no, it's not something reliable. So brothers and sisters, to conclude, when it comes to our ahadith, when it comes to all of these things that we base our religion on, we are going to be very, very careful that we make sure that it goes through that chain of our ulama, that we trust, of course, who have done the work that we can rely on, so that, inshallah, we don't make certain mistakes just because something felt good, inshallah. أقول قبل هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله. صلوات على محمد وآل محمد